Well, good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. Welcome to spring. Uh, that was a nice winter, but uh, all right. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to the book of Esther. We, uh, I was, I have not in uh, my 35 years of ministry, I've never preached through the book of Esther. I preached from the book of Esther in different messages, but I never have just gone through the book. And be honest with you, I'm enjoying it. If I'm honest about anything else, I'll tell you that too. But um, I... Preachers say that, be honest, and they tell you something, but they say the, the, the truth is, well, I, it's all the truth, I hope, uh, but I, I really am uh, enjoying it, and uh, I want to review just briefly from last week before we read the scripture this evening and then get into tonight's lesson. The last two lessons we gave at the end of the study last week from the first chapter and uh, part of the second chapter of Esther is we said sometimes followers have to say, no to their leaders and we talked about how when the leader asks you to do something that is against God contrary to God then you have to say no like the apostles they have to say we ought to obey God rather than man and uh, when that time comes there's uh, our allegiance always goes to God secondly we said the second lesson is we learn that God's always at work and we can always trust him He's always at work and we can always trust Him. You know, when the Bible says, He that watches over Israel or He that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, well, uh, that's not just uh, talking about Him not uh, dozing off on us. It's that He's not just watching, but He's always working. We said Esther's the only book in the Bible where God is not mentioned. The name God is not found in the book of Esther. But it doesn't mean He's not there. And it doesn't mean He's not working. And at times in your life when you don't see God or you don't seem to see Him working or He's not very obvious to you, you be assured He's working. And you can trust Him. He's, he does all things well. Uh, you may not understand it now. I may not understand it now. But I'll guarantee you when we get to heaven and God shows us from His viewpoint of how things went, we'll say, ah, <laughs> Now I understand, and uh, I, I, I see now that you, do it, you did all things well. Well, let's pick up, and we're in chapter 2 now. If someone would put this on low, I'd appreciate that. And uh, chapter 2, now we, we ended last week where they're, they're going through the kingdom. Now remember, Asheris came back after a defeat at the hands of the Greeks, and he's discouraged, and he's lonely, and there's no queen because he's banished Vashti. And so now they say, I know what he needs, he needs a queen. And in order to get a queen, they decide to hold the Persian beauty contest. And uh, they, they go throughout the land and gather uh, a bunch of uh, eligible young ladies to be the next queen. And so here we pick it up in verse number 8. It came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai, the, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people, nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned unto the second house of the women 
to the custody of Shea Ashgaz and, and the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in under the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Hegai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus, into his house royal, in the tenth month, which is the month Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. All right. And we'll stop there for now. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at the three characters. We're going to, the, the three main characters of the book are Esther, Mordecai, and you're going to introduce to the, to the third one tonight. And that's a man named Haman. All right. Let's look at Esther first of all this evening. All right. Esther, the first thing I want you to notice about Esther, we find out, is Esther's purity. Her purity. It was time of purification. In verse 12, it says, Every maid's turn was come to go into the king. It said that she had been 12 months, according to the manner of the women, for there were, those were the days of their purifications accomplished. They had six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors or spices, if you will. Uh, myrrh was very highly esteemed by the ancients of those days, and both for its scent and its purifying power. And the Jews... Uh, it was myrrh was part of their main ingredients in their anointing oil of the priests when they said I'll be in, they anointed the priests with the oil, but you know the dresses and their beds would be scented with myrrh, so the the purification process went about six months. In other words, before any lady would be permitted to come in to see the king, they'd have to have twelve months, one year. Of purification and and just clean for one year no uh, no relations with anybody else nobody else coming to them or touching them or anything and and it talks about purity now you think about if think about us coming to our king and how we ought to come pure and there's no substitute for purity when it comes to serving the king and it comes to being clean before the Lord. And so if we're going to be used of the king and come before the king, we must be clean and pure. What are the, what are the seraphims saying before the throne constantly, 24 hours a day, uh, in our time anyway? They don't have time there, of course. But always, night and day, all they're saying is, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, what did he say? Woe is me, and is me wasn't his horse, okay? He said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in unclean people. Boy, he saw who he was, and he saw how holy God was. And so you have to be clean and pure, not just to be a vessel, but to be a clean vessel for God, a clean vessel that he can use. You know, just, just the other day when I pulled a glass out of the cupboard, I looked in there, and there was some, something at the bottom that the dishwasher must not have got. And dishwasher was a mechanical one, not a human one, all right? Just, just making that clear, okay? And, uh, and, and you know what I did? I set that one in the sink and turned the hot water on and let it soak a little bit. I went up and got another cup and looked at that. And that was clean. And so I used that one. Hmm? I, wonder, I wonder how many times God has reached for a vessel. And he looked at us and he saw unconfessed sin and things that, that should not be in our life and God had to say set us aside and reach for another vessel hmm? clean no substitute for that Esther's purity and she's going to be greatly used by God you'll see that as the story unfolds the second thing I want you to see about Esther is her humility humility look at verse number 8 it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard and when many maidens were gathered together in Shushan the palace to the custody of Hegai that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody 
of Haggai, keeper of the women. That when, when you, you read that word, Esther was brought, the, the word there uh, carries a meaning that she was forcibly brought. In other words, it wasn't something she wanted to do. It was, it was kind of, it, it was, she didn't want to be one of those women. She didn't want the spotlight. In other words, it wasn't in her heart to say, man, couldn't I be queen? Boy, I could see myself on the throne. I could see myself in that position. Boy, think of all the nice clothes you get. Think of the jewels you get to wear. Think of, man, how cool would that be? That wasn't ever a thought in Esther's mind. She wanted nothing to do with that. That's, that's her humility. She was forcibly brought. She didn't want the attention. She had to be, listen, Esther, as you'll find out, was very willing to serve God, was very willing to do what God wanted, but she never wanted the spotlight. She never wanted the limelight. She had to be forced to that position. That's why when Jesus came, remember He taught His disciples, well, you all think that the greatest is the one who has people serving Him. And everybody, everybody sees, you think the greatest person is the guy with the corner office at the top of the building with the windows. And Jesus says, I tell you who the greatest is. The greatest is the, the guy who serves in the janitor's closet in the basement who cleans the building. The greatest among you, fellas, is going to be the servant of all. You don't look for recognition. You don't look for the spotlight. You don't look to, you just look to be a servant. That's humility. Her humility didn't say, I want the limelight. You know, I it don't don't you know, <laughs> just serve. Don't worry about titles. Don't worry about recognition. Just serve. That's what Esther did. That's very important. Before honor is humility. I don't think Esther ever would have been honored in the way God's going to honor her had she not been humble. Okay, God will bless the humble. So I see your humility, her purity, and then number three, verse number ten, Esther's secret minority. Her secret minority. Now, it's very interesting. Verse 10, it says, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred. How come she didn't? Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. So she does not tell anyone that she's a Jew. Now remember, they're in captivity. The Persians are in control. And, and she's not letting anyone know that she's a Jew. She wasn't born in Judah. She was born while they were in captivity. So she was born in Persia. And so uh, she's keeping that uh, secret, if you will, because Mordecai told her to. There were three, most of you know, there were three times that the Babylonians at the time came and invaded Judah and took captives back to Babylon. The very first invasion was when Daniel was taken and his friends those that had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. So they took the cream of the crop the first time in. Okay? The second time in, they took the next group of people. It was about seven years later. And, they took, and, and Esther would have been in that group in her family, in that second invasion. Uh, then from that time, about 12 years elapsed till the final invasion, and that's the time Jeremiah was the prophet in Judah. And he prophesied. And that's finally when they came in and they took the very poor and whoever was left and then they burned everything with fire. They ravaged the city. All right? And what, what, what we're meaning here is this, that both Esther and Mordecai uh, were of a minority race, especially in the land of Persia. And by the way, they wouldn't have been very rich. They would have been considered poor. But did you know God can use poor people? Did you know God can use minority people? You know, uh, anybody can serve God who will pay the price. Anybody can serve God who will yield themselves to God and make themselves available for God to use. You know, we, we used to sing that song as little kids, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world or all the children of the world, and He does. And He'll use anyone who will pay the price and be yielded to him. We see that with Esther. So that was her secret minority. But then notice number four, Esther's authority. Her authority. Look it down to verse number 20. Now, remember, let's back up. 
Who did he, in verse 17 and 18, who did the king put the crown on? He put the crown on Esther, chose her. She's now the queen. She's, she's in, a, in, a, in a high place of authority in the kingdom. But notice verse 20 again. Esther had not showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. That's an amazing thing. Yes, when she was younger, now Mordecai, her cousin, older cousin, I'm sure, uh, brought her up and, and taught her the right things and instilled in her the, the things of God. And she still listens to him even though she's a grown woman now. In fact, she's the queen of the land. And yet she still does as he told her to do. You know what that's called? That's called honoring your father and mother. Nothing, you know, somebody says, oh, I got I to gotta obey you and listen to you until I turn 18. And man, once I'm 18, I do what I want. You know what the problem is? You won't find that in the Bible. And certainly that's not honoring your father or your mother. Honoring them. And it's, 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 it's great. Like when she was brought up. You know what's great? Fame hadn't changed Esther. Position hadn't changed Esther. She was still the same. It shows her character. She had been taught to obey and respect authority, and she still did. She's the queen now, and Mordecai would be one of her subjects. <laughs> Things are completely turned around now. But she still listens and respects the authority of the one who acted as a father to her. And that's, that's, that's very, very important and very admirable. And it's going to come into play later in the story as well. Okay? Now, let's talk about Mordecai. We, we mentioned earlier in chapter 2, when the king, they, they had the big party thing in, in chapter 1, and then seven years have gone by before you get into chapter 2, and he's ready to get another queen and the Bible just says in verse 5, Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. You're going to find out with Mordecai when you get down to verse 21 of chapter 2. Would you look there with me? In those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door were wroth, and they sought to lay hand on the king Asahiris. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto the Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now that's, that, that just seems to be kind of slid in here in the last couple verses of chapter 2. But don't forget that. That's going to become a very important part of this whole story. Alright? And God just let us know that that took place. And, and, and uh, we see number one under Mordecai then, he was loyal. He was loyal. Just as disloyal as those men were, Mordecai was loyal. One of the most blessed traits in all the world is loyalty. And by the way, here he saves the king's life when you're going to find out what well, you know from chapter 1, and later on you'll find out later in this chapter with Amon, this, this was not the greatest king you ever worked under. This king had some serious flaws. Okay, He had some serious issues, as we would say. Uh, far from perfect, okay? Let's just put it that way. And yet still, uh, he was... He was his king over where the Jews were in captivity, and Mordecai was going to be loyal to the position of the king. He was going to be loyal to the office of the king. And he saved the king's life. And I think it's interesting that Esther, he told Esther about it. Esther certified it to the king. Did you notice what it said? She did thereof in Mordecai's name. She wanted to make sure he got the credit for it. That goes back to her humility, doesn't it? She could have just uncovered it and gotten all the glory for herself. And probably could have gotten more accolades and more things heaped upon her. 
But she wouldn't do that. She gave all the credit to Mordecai. And that's what we find out. Number two, under Mordecai, is a record was kept. Verse 23, the last, last phrase, it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. In other words, somebody wrote it into the congressional record, okay? And uh, that's going to come into play as well in a little bit. Uh, Mordecai, at that time, didn't receive any honor for what he'd done. No recognition for what he'd done. We don't know what took place or what happened during that time or what all else was transpiring, but somehow it got lost in the deal. And, and he never was honored or rewarded for saving the life of the king. It was simply written in the book of the Chronicles of the king. And the truth is, listen, the same can be said about many people that do things for God. May not get honored now. May not get recognized now. Nobody may say anything about it now, but there's a book being written. So there's a book being written that's recording. God is recording the things that you do for Him. Say, so is that right? Look at Malachi chapter 3, would you please? Hold your finger there in Esther or put a piece of paper in there. Go to the last book of the Old Testament. That's Malachi. If you get the Matthew, you passed him. Go back. Last book of the Old Testament. Malachi. It looks like Malachi. All right? Malachi. Malachi 3. Now look at verse 16 with me, will you? Malachi 3, verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him. For them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. There's a book of remembrance. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. And so he's saying, uh, God says, I listen, and I'm watching, and I write it down in the book of remembrance. It's not going to get overlooked, my friend. But don't, don't worry if, well, I did that and nobody recognized me. I said this and nobody said anything that I helped out. Hey, 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 hey. God's, God's written it down. God has record of that. And uh, you don't worry about the honor now. You know, remember what he said about the Pharisees who they, they like to pray out in public or they like to do their alms, their giving to the poor so everybody could see it. Why, why did they do that? So they could have the praise of men. And you know what Jesus said? He said, they have their reward. Basically saying, that's their reward. They're not going to get anything from me. Well, would you rather have praise from God or praise from men? Okay. Now, it's not wrong when someone does something good for you to thank them and to, to give thanks to them and write appreciation, a note of appreciation to them. That's not robbing them of their eternal reward. But for you to desire the praise of man, for you to be upset when you're not recognized, for something you've done for the Lord. That shows the motive of your heart was for you, not for God. Okay, And that's not the way Mordecai was. One day the reward would come and you're going to find out that's, uh, that day is going to fall into our story uh, as, we, as it unfolds here uh, throughout the book of Esther. Now, let's go back to the book of Esther and we're going to get into chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now we're going to meet the bad man. The bad man's name is Haman. H-A-M-A-N. After these things, verse 1, chapter 3, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman, to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, 
Then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. Even the people of Mordecai. Stop there for a minute. Let's talk about Haman. Number one, you notice promotion ruins Haman. Promotion didn't ruin Esther. She stayed humble. She stayed the same. Didn't change her a bit. But you cannot say the same thing about Haman. Somebody said success has ruined far more people than failure. That's true. Riches have ruined far more people than poverty. That's quiet. Haman, favorite of the king, it says in verse 1, Favorite of the king, advanced above the others, got proud. Became very proud. It reminds me of King Saul. Remember what God told, said to Saul? He says, when you were little in your own eyes, then I could exalt you to be the king. But now, you think you're something. You think you're, you're a big guy. Hey, you'll never be too little for God to use but you can certainly be too big for God to use. And so, uh, let, let, uh, don't, don't, don't get puffed up. Okay, Even when God promotes you. Even when you get, get ahead. David got proud and he numbered Israel. So he could boast in the number of his army and how many men he was leading. And then the strength. And, and, and remember, God, God killed people for that. He says, you're, you're, you're not to do that. Why? Your strength isn't in your numbers. Your strength isn't in your army. Your strength is in me. That's what God was telling him. But it was pride that got in the way. Joshua got proud after Jericho and just sent a few guys up to Ai. Didn't even ask God about it. Just said, okay, we, hey, he laid out, he listened to God and laid out that strategic plan to take care of Jericho. A plan that no one ever would have come up with without even firing a shot. And yet, AI, they just said, well, it's a little city. Let's just send a few guys up. Well, he learned a, a valuable lesson. Be careful. Be careful when success comes. Be careful. I told you before about a fellow who got very successful in business and, and got promotions, and with that, of course, raises in pay. And he decided to invest in a, in a motor home. Could take his family camping. The problem is, when are you going to go camping? They go camping on weekends. And because he had the money and the means and the promotion and the success, they started missing Saturdays and Sundays at church. They did that for a good 10 or 15 years. And God broke his heart, and he understood the error of his way. And he and his wife got back in church, but you know who didn't get back in church? The children didn't get back in church. They had been used now to missing church and being out of church. So be careful about your successes. Don't let promotion ruin you. Stay the same and keep your faith in God. Now, here's what takes place. The end of verse 2. All the, well, the, all the king's servants that were in the king's gate, what did they do? Bowed and reverenced Haman. All but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. You see, and by the way, you find out as they, as they pressed upon him day by day to do it, he was under pressure. He was under pressure to, to, to do this. I know, you know, some of you have that pressure. I know that uh, if you work in an area that requires the, the flu vaccine, you really feel the pressure that you've got to get that. Sometimes it's, it's, you lose your job if you don't get it. I know in a, in a couple jobs I had back in the day, it was the United Way. Everybody gives to the United Way. We want 100% participation. Uh, you know what? I, I'm not opposed to the United Way. I think that's fine. But I give to the, to the Lord's work. I, I give what I give is to God. And, uh, but, you know, you feel the pressure. <laughs> Because, you know, you want 100% participation. Well, he was feeling the pressure. 
Everybody's bowing down and reverencing Haman, but Mordecai won't bow. And I've said they press upon him. I'm sure he has to give them a reason. And that's why I think verse number 4 told, the very last sentence of verse 4 there, the last phrase after the colon, he told them that he was a Jew. He says, I can't bow down and do him reverence. They literally, this was a, this was not just a bow the knee. This was a prostrate to the ground, mouth in the dust, reverence for a deity. And Mordecai said, I can't do that. Why? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm not bowing down to any man. I bow down only to God. I only give God reverence, not man. So he refused to bow down and give reverence to a man when bowing down was an act to be given to God and not man. So I can't give to man what only belongs to God. When, when Peter came to those who Cornelius had gathered up, do you remember what happened when Peter walked in? Remember what Cornelius did? Fell down at Peter's feet? And of course, well, I won't say that, but Peter, what did Peter say? Peter said, get up. I'm a man. Oh, you bow down and worship me. I'm just a man like you are. Never, never wanted worship to come to them. And, and so he couldn't do that. Now, I want, you to, I want you to remember something. Look back in chapter 2, would you please? Look with me again at verse 5. Did you catch when it said there was in Shushan the palace a certain Jew named Mordecai? He was the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Anybody, did that sound familiar to anybody? Anybody else know who was the son of Kish? Yeah, Saul, a Benjamite. Yeah, Saul. Now, go back to chapter 3 and verse number 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him. Do you remember when Saul was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites? He spared somebody. The king. Remember that king's name? Agag. The Agagite. This was a descendant of the Amalekites. The Amalekites that God said you're to utterly destroy. And here they are all these years later. And, and listen, hey, how do you think, not only is Haman thinking that, that this Mordecai won't bow, then he finds out he, don't, he won't bow to you because he's a Jew. He's a what? Jews? The one that is supposed to annihilate my people? The ones that God said were to wipe me out? Well, I'll tell you who's going to wipe them out. I'm going to wipe them all out. That's in the Hebrew. You've got to dig deep to get that. But there it is. Wow. Israel still dealing with Saul's disobedience of not utterly destroying the Amalekites. Wow. So he doesn't bow, for he'll not prefer the glory of man above the glory of God. That's why, by the way, that's why, be careful. I think, it's, I think it's okay. I think it's right. I think it's biblical to call the pastor, pastor. Or Brother Slayball, as I'm called sometimes. I don't, I don't like being called reverend. Because the Bible says, holy and reverend is his name. So, I'm not, uh, I'm not in that league. Nor do I want to be. <laughs> okay? So, you shouldn't refer to that. That's, that's reserved for God. Holy and reverend is is His name. You don't call Him Father. We have one Father. That's our Father God. We don't call someone on earth in a, in a spiritual realm. Don't call, I don't call, I wouldn't call another man Master. Why? Jesus is the Master. There, there are certain titles that are reserved for Him, not for man. And so we have to be careful. And so those are titles only to be given to God. Mordecai withstood the pressure day after day after day. They tempted him. They kept coming after him. They, they derided him. They hated him. But he withstood the pressure. Faithful and loyal to his convictions. Do you have some convictions you'll stand up for? 
You have some convictions that you'll stand by no matter what the pressure, outside pressure is. He wasn't going to yield. And there's Haman. Haman walks out and Haman, it doesn't say how many of the people are bowing down, but there, there, there were anywhere from hundreds to thousands and people doing him reverence, but he didn't see any of them. All he saw was Mordecai. And he'd just get angry. His blood would boil. And he's got to find a way to wipe him out. Especially since he's a Jew. And by the way, let me say this. That's how Satan gets in our life. You know what he does? He'll get us, he'll get us to focus not on the, all the things that are good and the things that are going on right. He'll see focus on the one thing that isn't right. The one thing that we're not happy about. Hey, hey, of all the trees of the garden you can eat, what did Satan say to Eve? What about that tree? See, don't look at all those trees you can eat. Look at the one you're not allowed to eat of. How'd that work? Yeah, that, that turned out bad, didn't it? And it turns out bad when God gets you fo- when, when Satan gets you focused on the one thing that isn't good instead of the nine other things that are good. Sometimes when you get discouraged and you're thinking about something and you're getting down, get out a piece of paper and start writing down God's goodness to you. Write down your health. Write down your church. Write down the Bible. Write down salvation. Write down the Holy Spirit. Write down clothes to wear. Write down a house to live in. Start writing down all those things. Then you'll get to that one thing you don't like and you look at your list and say, you know what? Nine out of ten is pretty good. You know, I can, a baseball player can get a base hit three out of ten times and still make the Hall of Fame. A basketball player, if he can put the ball in the hoop five out of every ten times, he's a great player. 50%, 30%. How come we think we've got to have 100% to be happy? 100% to be, be, you know, to be content with what God's doing. Don't let Satan get your focus on the one wrong thing and you totally miss all the good things. Boy, he'll take you, he takes so many people down that way. He did with Haman as well. So Haman, number three, he seeks to kill all the Jews. Here's his plan. Verse, um, well, let's, let's keep reading here. Verse number eight. Haman said to the king, well, let's back up, verse seven. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast, they cast pur, that is to say the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. And Haman said unto the king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. And by the way, that's not true. They did keep the king's laws, okay? Um, therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they, be, that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and every of, of every, every people, rulers of every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language in the name of King Ahasuerus. And was it written and sealed with the king's ring? And that's why that seal of the king's ring, I don't know if you ever hear that expression, that's the law of the Medes and the Persians. And as this is expression comes from. Once that was signed, you couldn't change it. Uh, I heard that expression. My dad used that expression. Where did he get that? But uh, he was, I remember that as a kid. No, that's final. That's the law of the Medes and the Persians. Uh, that, that meant, that, don't discuss that anymore. That's done. All right? And that's the way it was. So the letters were sent by posts into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, 
and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing of the commandment was to be given in every province, was published unto all people, that they should be ready against that day. The post went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed. So all the Jews, young and old, men and women, all of them were to be killed. Haman hated the Jews. Wanted to kill them all. These are the Jews, of course, still in captivity. There was a remnant that had gone back. Remember, does anybody remember when this events in Esther are taking place? Between the chapters in the book of Ezra, chapter 7 and 8. That's about when this time period fits in. See, a remnant had gone back to begin to rebuild the, uh, the, the, the temple. And then a remnant will go back to rebuild the walls with Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and rebuild the walls. So some of the folks are gone, but everyone in the provinces of the Persian Empire, they have a death sentence on them on the 13th day of the 12th month. Okay? They're going to they're gonna be killed. Now, you understand, what we do always has an effect on others. Mordecai not bowing down thinking it's just him. And I don't think he did think it was just him. But he realized it will have an effect on other people. And no matter who you are, you think, well, what I do is my business. It doesn't matter. What I do. They don't like it, they can lump it. No, no, no. What you do affects other people. You all, everybody has an influence. In the, in the RU program, it, 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 one of the principles is our sinful habits hurt those who follow us. And one of the ways he illustrates that is he says if you, if you had a funeral, if you dropped dead, if you dropped dead tonight and your funeral was scheduled for Saturday, uh, you know, he, he asks how many people think you'd have 100 people at your funeral? And he hasn't put their hand up. You think you have 100 people at your funeral? Nobody would? Yeah, you would. Put your hand up. Do you think you have 100 people come to your funeral? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Don't be humble now, okay? Be honest, okay? How many think, keep your hand up, how many think you'd have 75 people come to your funeral? How many think you'd have 50 people come to your funeral? 25? Keep your hands up. 10? 5? Okay. 1? You'll be there, okay? <laughs> yeah. Now here's the thing. If you can't die without affecting 100 or 75 or 50 or 25 or 10 or 1, you can't live without affecting that. All of us affect other people with decisions we make and things we do. And, and, and Mordecai's decision affected others. Now, one interesting note. It says they cast per, that is a lot. It's kind of like uh, they rolled the dice or they, they drew the straws. That's what they often would do in those days to determine what they should do. And uh, they, they finally came down to the 13th day of the 12th month. And... It's interesting, when they gather together, if you notice in verse 7, the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur. That's when they decided to do this. The first month, and it's scheduled for execution in the twelfth month. So they have not quite a year, but they'll have like 11 months before they have to carry this out. But it's interesting that he calls it Nisan, and the Jews called that first month Abib, A-B-I-B. But Nisan was the Babylonian word for it. And the, the, by the way, the Jews' first month is not January, it's April. That's why it's Abib. That was always their, uh, first, their first month of the year. And so well, all, all that to say is, you know, they called it after the Babylonian name and it's so easy to be in the world and be influenced by the world. And we start calling things that the world calls them instead of calling it the way God calls it and staying true to our convictions and true to what God says. Be careful about that, all right? And, and, and it's so true that uh, if, you, if you get caught up with the things of the world, 
you'll, you'll become like the world. We are in the world. We are not to be of the world. We don't, we don't, we, we, we try to uh, please the Lord and not please the world. Don't, when in the world, don't pick up the worldly habits. Okay? So easy to do, so easy to have happen. And don't let that happen. All right, number four, and we'll wrap it up. Number four, Haman bought off the king. Did you read what he said in verse 9? He says, I'm going to pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those who have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasury. He's going to pay really the equivalent of $20 million today. I can say that was a lot of money back then. That's a lot of money today. <laughs> but you think about how much money that was back then. And, and he allowed the Jews to be killed. Now, it's not that necessarily he's going to pay that. He's going to bring it into the king's treasury. But notice he says, I'm going to bring it into the king's treasury. What's he going to do when he kills all the Jews? He's going to take all their stuff. Huh. Sure. And he's figuring, I should get $20 million out of this. At least that's what I'll give to you. Whatever is above that is going to me. Okay? That's a little unwritten there, but I think that's what he's uh, the kind of guy he really was. And... The king took the ring from his hand. That's his signet. Uh, thing obviously from his finger. And it was the official seal. And once, once the edict was made and it had the king's seal and the wax, it, you couldn't undo it. There was no undoing at all. It had to be carried out. And he was really, when he handed that signet to that ring to Haman, he's telling Haman, whatever you write, whatever you decide to do, you have my seal on it. It's like, it's like handing over a blank check to someone with your signature on it. Saying, go ahead and fill it out. Whatever amount you need. Okay? So that's what, that's what the king did. That's, that's how weak, really, the king was. I don't think Hass here is necessarily a real terrible guy, a bad guy, but he was a very weak guy. He was so easily influenced by other people. So easily influenced by what others wanted him to do, what others wanted to tell him. Didn't have much of a backbone. And here he could be bought off and pressured into doing something that he, he really didn't have any bone to pick with the Jews. If they were that disobedient to the laws, don't you think he'd have known about it? He would have heard of something about this people that, that wouldn't, didn't want to listen to me. But he heard nothing. So it was sealed with the king's ring. And the, the silver is going to be brought into the treasury. Uh, of the king. And Haman thinks he'll become wealthy. So the chapter ends with the Jews facing death and complete extermination. Now don't forget the last few verses of chapter 2 and that story about Mordecai uncovering the assassination plot against the king. You're going you're gonna to see that again. And we're going to look into chapter 4 next week. And, and we'll see if Esther came into the kingdom, as Mordecai tells her, for such a time as this. All right, let's stand together, shall we, for prayer. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this marvelous, marvelous story uh, through the book of Esther. It's, uh, it's amazing to see it unfold and amazing to see. Uh, Lord, I... I it, those of us who know the rest of the story, it's amazing to see you working and, and bringing things to pass for you to deliver your people. And Father, I pray that we'll, we'll, we'll take the, the lessons we've gone over tonight, the, 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 the principles from each of these three different individuals, Esther and Mordecai and Haman. We'll, we'll, you'll help us to be the people you want us to be. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to have copies of the Bible tonight to study. And I pray that each of us would live the Bible we've been reminded of tonight and we've learned this evening. May you bless us for the Bible we live, not just the Bible we know. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Watch over us as we go our separate ways. May others see Jesus in us this week. It's in his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. It's 498 in the book if you need that. And uh, let's sing that together, all right? Every day with Jesus. Ready?
Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Choir members, come right on up.